So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another outstanding Authors of Google, Google Talk. Um, today we're pleased to host uh, Mike Mariner and the co-founders of the Road Trip Nation organization. Uh, they, what is Road Trip Nation, you may ask? It's uh, an outstanding example of a dream that actually never dies. It keeps on going. So back in college, uh, Mike and his friends went on this road trip. They interviewed a few people. They posted some videos online. It became this like long-going tradition. You know, when One road trip leads to another, leads to another, and in this case, leads to a company. So not only um, do they have a PBS series that, that was picked up um, detailing their adventures, but they have a foundation that encourages um, high school and, and college kids to start their own road trip to really explore their own communities. And so they'll um, tell us what they're up to most recently, and we'll also play a video. So uh, Mike, did you want to talk about the video briefly? Sure. Um, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll begin the story with kind of the end in mind and uh, show a little bit of a video of a snapshot of what, of what Road Trip Nation is um, today from our, one of our recent series on uh, public television. So we'll just kick it off with this video. On your tombstone at the end of the day, they're going to see three things. They're going to see your birth date, they're going to see that dash, and they're going to see your death date. The front and the back, they're done. But the thing that has the most importance to me is that dash. What happened in your life during the time you were born to the time you passed away? What defines you as a person? Hi, I'm with Road Trip Nation. And uh, we're going to be traveling across the country for six weeks. From the west coast to the east coast in an RV. And interviewing people whom we believe followed their passions. And meet with people that are in really interesting places. We're kind of at a loss for what we should do, so hoping to talk to the people who do things that we really look up to. I feel like I'm just spinning my wheels right now, and I'm ready to catch something and go. Where were you when you were our age? What fears or anxieties did you have? I really was like you. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I wanted to see what's out there. We traveled in a school bus, tattooing all over the country. I was a messenger boy. Whatever it takes to pay your rent so you can act. I was really lost. I was either going to end up pregnant or in jail or dead, or I was going to be able to change my life. It feels so good, I think, to look into your motivations and your apprehensions. I mean, it sounds silly to say you profit from your mistakes, but you do. I mean, when you make a mistake and you go in the wrong direction, it will help you somewhere. I am nervous about taking a step into the unknown. And it's a call on what you see as failure, you know? Never doing what I wanted to do is failure to me, you know? It's a huge roller coaster, right? There'll be high times, low times, happy times, sad times. And you just have to hang on. Never give up on your dreams. No excuses, Kyle Maynard. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. We're surrounded by cows. This has, like, been the most surreal place I've ever been to. America is so big. There are a million experiences and there are a million thoughts that you can think and a million definitions that can be added to who you are and how you see yourself in the world. Your heart is like a GPS system. The GPS system in your car will tell you which way to go, but it's not going to turn your car for you. Your heart's telling you to turn left, you better turn left. And I think a lot of people wait too late to listen to their heart. Every single person has a story, and every person came from somewhere. I have these ideas of, you know, what I want in my life and all these things, but no one ever knows what's going to be coming up ahead, and it could change everything, and it could be better than you even expected it. I just can't wait to see what the next few weeks have in store. So we kind of wanted to kick off with some footage. Uh, as you guys will kind of learn to know, we're not really motivational speakers. Uh, we really don't bring a lot of the, uh, the drive to our presentation. So uh, I think a big part of it is just sharing stories from the road. And I think that's what we really wanted to kind of engage you guys with, with some of the stories that we've been uh, aggregating over the past 
12 years now. Um, and kind of share, you guys, uh, share with you guys kind of where Road Trip Nation started out and what it has become because as you can see from this, uh, this trailer, uh, we're in our 10th season on public television. We've had an opportunity to write three books. Uh, we've been sending thousands of students on road trips throughout the United States and actually around the world. Um, and what we wanted to kind of share with you guys is some of the, the findings and, and some of the discoveries that we have collected uh, through these experiences. But we're very much on the back end of things. We, we usually are behind the scenes. And so the three of us actually don't get a lot of opportunities to, to share the stories that we've had along the journey. So that, that's probably kind of what we hope to get out of it. And, and we're really, we're all about Q&A. And so we open it up at the end of this to answer some questions and kind of engage some conversations. So everyone always asks, like, how did Road Trip Nation start? You know, was it a, was it a business plan? Was it some kind of like postdoctoral thesis or something like that? But it was actually none of that. Uh, it was really just Nate, Brian, and I being in school and wondering, like, well, what do we want to do with our lives? And we started to realize, like, there's no class in school to help you figure out what do you want to do with your life. We thought that was kind of funny because there's all these classes for like math and English and science. And those are obviously really important things, but like we felt like the big elephant in the room was like, well, what do you want to do with your life? And so when we asked our teachers this, they said, oh, go, go talk to your school counselor. Maybe they, they can help you, you know, figure out what do you want to do with your life. And so we went to our counselor, and the counselor told us, okay, take, take the, I think it was like the Myers-Briggs test or something like that. You know, you fill in some dots, and, and we were like, seriously, you know, like this, this is... I was supposed to be a plumber. Yeah. That, that was the big finding. I should be a plumber. Um, so, so essentially, you know, at that point, we really felt intuitively that we needed something more exploratory, something more kind of, some, something more humanized. And so that's when we had the idea, you know, it wasn't as much to create Road Trip Nation as it was, what if we could, you know, hit the road and go talk to people who are doing interesting things all across America and ask them, how did you get to where you are today? And, and I, we, think, I, I think it really came in this, like, real visceral sense of, like, I remember being in college and, like, passing my resume out at a career fair, and I was supposed to be, I, I was a business major, and so it was like a little assembly line, like business majors at, at the school is at become consultants. And so I was passing my resume out to like Arthur Anderson and all these different companies, and I remember like handing my resume to a guy and saying like, I have no idea what you do, or what I'm applying for, like what is this thing? And I remember taking him out to lunch one day, and. Uh, I was like, I just need to see what this thing's about, like, that I'm applying for. And I remember getting to lunch, and he had a suit and tie on. And I was like, I waited politely for a while. And I was like, so do you have to wear this suit all the time? And he was really fired up about it. He was like, yeah, you get to dress nice. They give you a budget for clothes. And like, the blood just completely drained out of my body. Um, I could just instantly, in that one simple moment, realize that this whole path that I was put on to like, make money and get that mortgage and be a professional was just kind of falling apart at the simplest thing of like, I can't wear a suit every day. I think we each of us had that kind of freak out moment where we really realized we needed to see what else was out there and what like we were interested in. And I think so much of it was lack of exposure. Like to, to Nate's point, like we didn't really know what was out there. And to you know, what Mike was saying, like you know, you take these tests, these assessment tests, and Nate figures out he's going to become a plumber. But we really needed something more human. We really needed this kind of like it's almost a, a frustration that at the end of the day, we just wanted to go out and talk to people from all walks of life and ask them, like, how did you get to where you are? Like, was there ever a time in your life that perhaps you're going through a period of ambiguity or you're displaced or you just weren't sure where the next step was? Or how did you kind of, like, identify those values within and kind of see that? And, and how did you kind of align a lifestyle or a culture to a job? And I think these are some of the questions we were challenging with. And it wasn't like academia was bringing this to us. And this is where... As you guys know, like a lot of cool projects sometimes start in a garage. This project just started on a, in a motorhome. So we bought my parents' old beat-up motorhome. The thing barely ran. I mean, Nate it and I pretty run. much, we pretty much fixed the thing, you know, as we travel across the United States. Um, and, uh, and this was kind of our vehicle. This was really kind of our, this was kind of our, our space. And we, we uh, so this thing was, you know, old beat-up motorhome. We painted it green because the paint was on sale at Home Depot. I mean, we were funding this thing through credit cards. It wasn't like we had some agent behind us that was like, hey, we're going to make you guys some reality show on MTV. It was very, very sincere and authentic. And we started just to kind of question, like, you know, who's out there doing creative things? Who's out there really changing the world? Like, where are some of these change agents? And let's ask them, like, what's driving them? And so that's kind of what led us to uh, the, the people that we actually ended up interviewing. We, we booked over 85 interviews. We got denied probably 500 times, 1,000 times. 
And we found these people through magazine articles uh, on, on, you know, um, different, you know, subscriptions that we're applying, you know, magazines, we're going combing through mastheads. We kind of found ourselves at newspaper stands just saying, where are the cool people? What are they doing? And let's go talk to them and ask them, how did you get to where you are today? And it was kind of like this simple sense of like, okay, I like snowboarding and I like art. Well, what about the guys that like put that together, like the art on snowboards? And so like literally just cold called Burton Snowboards and said like, can we talk to somebody there? Uh, I'm kind of a tech geek, so I called, uh, I was watching TV and there was a Dell commercial and I got the 1-800 number off the commercial to buy a computer and I just asked for Michael, Michael Dell. Um, and it was about six transfers later and I ended up speaking to Laura Strange who was overseeing all of his communications and uh, six months after that we were, he was sh sitting shotgun in the, in the actual original RV. Uh, but it was literally just cold call, no connections. I cold called the Supreme Court and asked for Sandra. Um, Mike ended up calling the director Saturday Night Live every three days for three months straight until she finally picked up the phone on the stage for uh, MTV Music Videos Awards or right. something. Yeah. And, and it, it wasn't just like high up executive or you know, people like that. I mean, it was, it was a lobsterman from the coast of Maine. It was an environmental activist in DC. It was just people who kind of, how we defined it later is like people who define their own roads in life, which is really the mission of Road Trip Nation today. Um, but over the, over the course of two and a half months, we drove over 15,000 miles and then Brian's old family beat up motorhome, interviewed over 84 people. Um, and I think that's what we want to do is show you guys kind of a little bit of a glimpse of that road trip. Uh, we ended up buying this old kind of beat up um, camera, video camera. None of us had any film experience. We weren't film majors, anything like that. But around that time, like video cameras were getting pretty cheap. Um, so we ended up just kind of like filming everything. And we were able to then kind of aggregate some of that footage together towards at the end of that trip. So here, here's a little glimpse into one uh, section of our road trip from, I think, from about like Vermont down through Maine and then into Boston. You can work hard and you can hopefully be good at what you do, but things like Burton, that's a once in a lifetime deal that somehow I happened to hook up with a guy that invented a culture. I, uh, I don't know, I realized I sucked at math and shit early on and I focused on artwork and also punk music was going off at that point. You know, it was all Clash, Sex Pistols, Ramones was the whole program. My first date with my wife was The Clash in Montreal. So I kind of went on that path. I didn't have any calculated route I was going to take because my parents didn't have a clue about that stuff. My father worked in a, a factory making cottage cheese and my mother was a beautician from Maine. I think a lot of it is, uh, as you guys are, are trying to, to prove here is you, you really just have to go with what you believe in and what you really want to do. Simon Woodruff said the, uh, the world will conspire to support you if, you if you really magnify what it is you believe in. 
people will rally around you and help and I think you'll find that from your family and your friends and everything else if you decide you're going to be a sculptor if you decide you're going to be an architect or you decide you're going to be a kick-ass accountant you know, it's like if you really believe it and you wear it on your shoulder and you really do it with distinction the world will will conspire to do it I don't know, distinction is everything you, know, you gotta be willing to do that and if you look at any examples of people that have been successful in what they're doing and not not monetarily successful successful in their life they are generally pretty distinctive individuals and it's because they've got the self-confidence to have a point of view and I think that can be a farmer in the boonies of Vermont or Montana or something and, and it can be the most progressive artist in New York City but they will both have self-confidence in what they're doing they'll both have a point of view they'll have a philosophy that they'll back up just do it with some friggin' balls. That's yeah. all I, I'd say is like I just, I don't know. There's so many people that I just have this sort of milk toast existence and they get frustrated that they sort of get washed around in the, in the flow. And it's like, you're doing that to yourself. That's kind of where I'm at at this point and what I'm trying to inspire people here to do, that you can do whatever the hell you want. It's, it's frightening to be making decisions now because you feel like, okay, I'm going to make a small decision now and that's probably going to affect the way my life pans out. Sure. What is the next What's step? What's the next step? Because I don't know. And it scares me. <laughs> and I don't want to do something that I hate. But I also am afraid of taking the serious risks that I think involve not doing something that I hate. <laughs> I'm studying post-colonial and African-American migration narratives. Holy wow. Whoa. See? Can I get one of those? <laughs> Another one of those? That was sweet. I can go to lunch with you guys. Where are you going? I don't know. Where are, we, where are you taking me? I want to go with you. you. I'll like hop on this thing right now. Do you totally. know? Now that I think about it, maybe the core of everything is that I'm not believing in myself. To some degree, I feel like, you know, the path that I'm on is also has been laid out for me in some ways. Sometimes I've had a kind of crisis of, you know, is this really what I'm supposed to do? Or have people just told me all the time that this is what I, you know, what I want to do? And that, you know, I'm like, is, is this it? Is there something else? It's funny, I actually, uh, a, a bunch of people have approached us over the years, my partner and, and, and me, to write a book about the history of Nantuck Connectors. And I never really wanted to write a book about the history of Nantuck Connectors. I want to write a book about figuring out who I was. Cheers! Yeah. <laughs> Cheers to the new world. And there I was living on Nantucket. And the, and the first summer I was out there, I got my commercial fishing license because we had no other way to make money. You know, I wore these big rubber boots and the whole fishing outfit and everything. My parents came out there a couple times and I'm sure they looked at me like, what is this kid doing? I had another kind of life. It was the life of uh, a traveling vagabond, essentially. I was traveling Europe and and having extraordinary, unusual experiences, no question about it. The last thing I had to do at night was I'd have to wash out all the buckets. I had the shells and the scallop guts in them. And I'm on this back dock right over the water, Nantucket, and it's midnight. And it was uh, 
Christmas Eve and the water is literally freezing on the dock under my feet. I didn't even notice it. And all of a sudden I turned and feet come up from underneath me. I slam on the dock. The hose is like shooting up in the air. I'll never forget that. I'm just sitting there looking up in the sky thinking, what the hell am I doing? I mean, what am I doing? I'm like washing out guts of a scallop bucket on Christmas Eve in Nantucket. You know, I'm 23 years old. I went to Brown. I mean, I should be doing something different. My parents are pissed at me. Well, I ended up living on Nantucket for four more years and building this business. And even two or three years into Nantucket Nectars, my parents were like, starting a juice company? I mean, are you yeah. kidding me? Yeah. I mean, you're starting a juice. Who starts a juice company? You know? <laughs> I had a very funny story when I was nine. I wrote some compositions, you know, as kids do. I just wrote these little things. And my mother put them in from an, for an arts festival in our village. Everybody in, in England, every village has an arts festival. And the time came for the giving out the awards and prizes. And he held my compositions above his head. And he said, these compositions are so bad that not only can I not consider for them for the competition, that goes without saying, but this young man should be discouraged from ever composing again. That's what he said. There's a million different paths to get there and everyone thinks there's one when they give you advice and there, there isn't one. Could anyone have ever predicted my path? You know, okay, this is how you're going to make it, okay? <laughs> what you do is, you want to start a juice company? Okay, this is how you do it. You should move to Nantucket, start a boat business, end up being a fisherman, and then get into distribution and start a juice business. That's how you get into juice. Like, who would ever say that? So it's important to know what, you, what you're after. And then if you know what you're after and you really want it, then you don't look around wondering whether you're better or worse than the next person, because it's not about that. It's about what you want to do. Freude, schöne Götter, Funken, Tochter aus Elysium. It's the Ode to Joy of Beethoven. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just a little glimpse into that experience. Um, and like we said, I mean, we did 84 interviews, you know, over 15,000 miles, two and a half, almost three months on the road. And, you know, I think over and over again, everyone always tries to boil down into kind of one, one insight. Um, but we think that one of the big kind of overarching things that we found was this notion of like defining your own road in life. And especially at that age when you're growing up in American culture, there's all different ty types of kind of expectations and things that we kind of heard a few of our people on the road call noise trying to kind of influence the decisions that we're making around that time in your life where you're trying to figure out what you really want to do. And that was the overarching theme that we found was that like, you know, a lot of defining around road life is about kind of shedding that noise and getting down to what are the elements that really make you who you are? What are the things that your interests, your values, the things that kind of make up the, the DNA and the grain of who you are and how do you, how do you kind of shed enough of that noise to kind of build your life around those things that matter, that matter the most? I think one of the things for me was uh, said by uh, a guy named Randy Komazari, who's an author of The Monk and the Riddle. And he, he said, in perfect metaphor to our experience, he said, life is only linear in the rear view mirror. And I think for me that was really instrumental because I had this expectation from family and friends that like, you had to, if you, were, if you were interested in art and you wanted to be creative, then you, then you were likely going to live under the boardwalk poor and homeless. And I really, really listened to that. Um, and that was what put me on the path to study business and kind of go down that route. And, and that's where ultimately I felt hollow. And it wasn't until we had done this road trip where I was able to see that you could take your interest in something as uh, odd as lobsters or as something as exciting as snowboards and you can put them together. Um, maybe not lobsters and snowboards, but you know, for me it was design and snowboards or design and technology. But you can mash these things up. It's not this like sit on an assembly line kind of approach that I think we have both in our current mentality as well as the way in which we raise our children in our educational system. So it, it freed my thinking up to think that so much more was possible and I think it was those voices in, in my head that kind of kept, kept us going through the, uh, the adventure of starting Road Trip Nation after the road trip. So it was such a transformative experience on the three of us that we really kind of came back from this three and a half month journey really having a, a, a drive and a desire to share it. We had a lot of friends that we felt kind of needed to hear some of these stories to kind of break down and, and you know, break down some of their master plans or even just provide perspective. I think that was probably one of the biggest things that I took away from being on this journey was just perspective of, of, um, 
of identifying who you are and, and, and how to align it. Like you guys heard, Jagger is actually one of the most influential interviews that we had on that trip, you know, as he kind of just talked about distinction. And you got to wear it on your shoulder. you got to be proud about it. And, and I think we had the fear of kind of having this milk toast existence that you kind of get washed around. And I think, like, coming back from that journey, it was really something that the three of us went through, but it was more of a, of a desire to share it. And I think that's what we wanted to share with you guys is kind of like that original trip because it's rooted in everything that we do now. It, it really kind of provided the framework of, of, of where we are today. Uh, but it was definitely a long long journey of, of how we got to, from that original road trip and an old beat up motorhome to, to today. So everyone always asks that question, okay, like we, we know you took Brian's little family RV, painted it green and lived in it for three months and did the whole thing, but how did it like evolve into this, you know, organization that has an annual documentary series and a nonprofit education foundation that has curriculum and schools across America and all that stuff. Um, and you know, I think there's no real clean answer. Uh, I, mean, I think the best way we can describe it is it was a very incremental kind of evolutionary process over a 10-year period and that we didn't like go out and get venture capital and like scale it over two years. I mean it's something that we did very incrementally in, in as organic and mission-based a manner as we, as we could. Um, and it really started with on that road trip we had met someone who was a writer at Forbes magazine when we were in New York City, and she kind of tagged along for some of those interviews we did in New York City, like Len Riggio from Barnes Noble and Saturday Night Live. Um, and she ended up doing a very small article in Forbes on Road Trip Nation. It was like definitely not a cover story. It was like literally two inches, um, but it got a little bit of attention. And we learned that big New York book publishers, if you get an article in a magazine like that, there's kind of some credibility. So through a series of events, we ended up getting a publishing contract with uh, Random House's uh, imprint, Ballantine Books, and that's the book that's in the back there. But essentially, we had the chance for a year and a half after that road trip to kind of write a book about our experiences, really kind of reflect on some of the content and the stories and the insights we gained over that experience um, and release that book. The book came out in 2003. It didn't sell very well at first. It was like the 600,000th best-selling book in America. And we were like, you know, no, no big deal. Like, we you know, had a great experience. And then, um, then the publisher got behind it and put us on this major PR blitz. And we were on the... CNN, Carson Daly Show, Newsweek, NPR, uh, Today Show, and the, the day we were on the Today Show, it became the 15th, uh, 15th best-selling book in America on Amazon. It was just for like a day, but it was like, you know, we still, still claim it, you know, mom and dad are proud. Um, and, uh, but that, that, around that time, there was lots of different kind of energy for Road Trip Nation, people wanting to, Hollywood agents, and MTV show this, and blah, blah, blah. And around that time, that's when we really got intentional with kind of building a grassroots organization that was mission-based that could empower other people to define their own roads in life. Um, and one of the first steps that we took was to launch a series on public television by first uh, creating a program on college campuses called Behind the Wheel, where college students could apply for the chance to go on these annual summer road trips. We had a few um, organizations that got behind us to support it and kind of fund the production. Um, and over a period of seven years, we expanded to 350 college campuses across America. We created a fleet of motorhomes. Um, these trips went around the world to New Zealand, Australia. There was Road Trip Nation, Israel and Hebrew, um, Africa, South America, all over. Um, and the movement kind of proliferated on, on a college level. And the first uh, three minute overview that we kind of showed you was season seven from that. Um, and then the interesting thing about this was that over this period of time, we chose to go with public television because we could have a, a, a mission-based approach, the creative control. Um, but the interesting part was that by doing that, public television also allows you to maintain the rights to all of your content. Um, if we would have gone with like an MTV or something, it would have been gobbled up by Viacom and we would have had like a salary from them. But because it was public media, um, we were able to then you know, build a, an independent organization around it and, and have some longevity. Um, so can you show the, yeah. the content archive? So essentially now, um, you know, 10 years later, after doing Road Trip Nation and mobilizing this kind of movement of other student road trips, not only were we mo mobilizing these experiences to impact the students' lives who were participating and creating this TV show and whatnot, we were also creating this enormous digital content archive, which I don't think we could have predicted the power of it from, from the beginning. But um, essentially, it's almost like a, a you know, a... a, a, a ethnographic study, someone, mentioned, someone called it that the other day, but in terms of like, if you could mobilize teams of road trippers for 10 years to go across America and across the world and collect people's personal stories like a huge oral history project and just ask them a simple question, how did you figure out what do you wanted to do with your life and what were the steps you've taken to get where, where you are today and what are the insights and kind of lessons learned along that journey? 
that's, that, those, those are the stories and insights we've been collecting for the past, for the past 10 years. Um, and that's what's really led us into the new education work we're doing. Um, in 2008, we saw something really interesting happening in outside a little town in Pittsburgh called, called Mon Valley. We've been doing Road Trip Nation as the college model in the PBS series for about five years. And I think we were kind of thinking about what's, what's the next step for Road Trip Nation? How can we spread this impact further? Um, you know, we were mobilizing several green RV trips a year around the world, but was there another model that could be accessible to more and more students? especially students that are growing up in communities where they don't have a lot of chances to explore or connect with leaders and explore what's possible for their own futures. And so outside of Pittsburgh, there was a little town called Mon Valley, a school district there, and there was a lot of um, essentially mining jobs in that area, but the mining industry was drying up, and the district was looking for a way to engage their students and show them that there's a whole world of possibilities for their future. Um, in short, they were looking for a project, a kind of a career exploration, project-based learning activity. And our, our documentary series was airing on primetime in WQED. And some of the leadership in the school district there said, we got an idea. Let's do Road Trip Nation, Western Pennsylvania, and let's localize it. And this is when things really got interesting, because it showed us that you really don't need a green RV uh, or a cross-country trip to have the, road tr the impact from Road Trip Nation. When you really strip it away, the impact was always about these conversations that were happening on the road, the people that you meet. Um, and so these students in Mon Valley and their teachers, they created this kind of ad hoc duct tape road trip nation curriculum. And the students were road tripping around Western Pennsylvania and Mon Valley in their own cars, on school buses, just on day trips, interviewing entrepreneurs, local restaurateurs, the taqueria owner, the guy who started the movie store, local small businesses, um, EMT technicians. And at the end of the year, we had, been kind of, we had been kind of somewhat following this, but we were more involved in our TV show and that kind of a thing. At the end of the year, they flew us out and we walked into this kind of uh, conference area hall where there was hundreds of kids organized into teams of three showing off their projects with like kind of poster boards and computers with showing some of the videos from their road trips and the people they'd interviewed. And at that moment, we knew that we had kind of stumbled upon what we thought could be the ultimate kind of reincarnation of what the, the road trip nation movement could be, which was not only having people watch the experiences of other students who were lucky to go on the green RV, but to actually create the experience themselves. Um, and so in 2008, we launched RoadTripNation.org as a 501c3 organization that creates curriculum and tools and resources for uh, teachers, especially in low-income low communities, to, build, to bring this Road Trip Nation experience um, to, to their students. So we're going to walk you through a little bit of that curriculum. Before we keep going, is there any, any kind of quick questions on kind of the history of Road Trip Nation or how we got here before we dive into the, the, the education piece? Real exciting part. So, you become like the experts on this topic, right? Because you've got a movie, you've got a book, so people come up to you and say, so what should I do with my life? And you get this question. So besides telling them that you should be a product manager at Google, what else do you tell them? <laughs> well, be, be a product I, manager at Google. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I you think, guys hit the jackpot. I, I think we really tried not to be the experts in anything. You know, I think for us it wasn't, it wasn't about people telling us what to do. I mean, I think everybody can kind of relate to that. Like, to discover your own road, to make it for yourself, that matters so much more than somebody coming down and saying, you know, you, you look like you make a great plumber. And so for us, like, our whole experience is about sharing stories. And so it's not for us to become the experts on career exploration. It's for us to present the avenue and the opportunity to explore for the individual and for that person to define their own road. So experts of none, maybe. Did you make the, uh, did you make the cold calls before the trip, or you were calling people along the trip? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, we made all the cold calls, and we actually booked all the interviews before we left. Um, How so many? We, How so many were there? 84 interviews oh, total. 84. So we had a lot of intention. It wasn't like we were nomads, just kind of like going with the wind and kind of just kind of wherever we end up, we end up. And we had a lot of intention. I think it was a lot of just proof to our parents that we had a project happening. You know, as you guys can remember that, you know, at that age of people, you know, your parents. And we had a lot of pressure from, you know, kind of like, what are you guys going to do? And we really felt that we wanted to have that intention lined up front. And once we start booking interviews, we really needed to kind of schedule all that out, right? So once we landed an interview with, you know, Justice Henry O'Connor, then we, you know, we wanted to interview, you know, some other folks. He really started to build out the itinerary. And that actually really built a lot of momentum for our project. How did you screen out the uh, 84 people? Yeah, it's kind of a self-selecting prophecy almost. Um, a lot of people said no. We got rejected a lot. And the people that we accepted was really based on they remembered a time in their life that they were like us. 
And so it was almost like giving back. And I think that was one of the biggest things, why people said, well, how do a couple of, you know, scrappy kids out of college you know, kind of book some of these interviews with Michael Dell or you know, Howard Schultz, the chairman of Starbucks, or the hairstylist to Madonna and Lenny Kravitz? Honestly, they remember the time in their lives that they could have used some advice that they were giving us. Like they identified with us. And I think once they saw us, that age and that, that turmoil or that ambiguity kind of creep back in and saying, wow, you know, I wish I had someone that would have put some advice on my table. And so they really identified with the age and kind of our situations that we're going through. And we, we've seen that with the students today who are going through the curriculum. So over the last three years, over 100,000 students have gone through the Road Trip Nation Experience curriculum on a high school level. And it's the same thing. I mean, that was one of our first pilot ever for the curriculum was in Fresno, in, in a, a corner of Fresno called uh, Orosi, California, southeast Fresno County. And a lot of the students there, and the teachers in the school district at first was like, well, who are they going to interview in Orosi? There's no one, there's no, you know, Michael Dell here or whatever. But we realized is that there are leaders in everyone's community. When you localize it, those conversations become even more relevant, more impactful, because, because there's, a, there's, kind of, there's a gap in social capital we've seen in a lot of communities where students from you know, a certain part of Orosi may not have access to interviewing even EMT technicians or local lawyers or, you know, or local government officials. Or like one team uh, from Fresno interviewed the mayor of Fresno. And to them, the mayor of Fresno was like Barack Obama. That was like the biggest deal ever. And, and you know, one of the most impactful interviews we've ever, we've ever seen was on our, in our first pilot. Um, some of the students there interviewed a gang violence activist in, in East Southeast Fresno County who was in one of the earliest California, Central California gangs, you know, was put in prison when he was like 19 years old, got out on early parole because he did, um, you know, he, he worked off some of his time, and now he's kind of giving back to his community. But to him, to those students, that issue of gang violence is so central in the California Central Valley that that was, that was their Michael Dell. And to kind of have them localize that experience, um, and, and so what we've seen is that now the students are doing the cold calling, and that's part of the curriculum. Um, and so actually, why don't we just jump into showing a little excerpt of the sure. curriculum. But th this was one of the big humps we had to get through from Road Trip Nation, which was that how do you, how do you scale the impact of this experience? We know that pr providing a transformative experience by kind of helping students get outside their comfort zone, connecting with leaders, is a huge way to kind of help students figure out what do they want to do with their lives. But being in the green RVs is obviously limiting. Um, and so what we did was, if you can click on the, uh, the lessons and projects, the table of contents. So this is essentially roadtripnation.org. Um, there's roadtripnation.com, which is our, our public television focus site and college programs and kind of student-facing site. Roadtripnation.org is the educational resources that school districts bring into the classroom as a project-based learning curriculum. It's been aligned to the um, educational standards for English language arts. Um, so it's kind of like official on the back end and funded by the California Department of Education and the Hewlett Foundation. But on the front end, it feels student-based and exactly like you would feel if you were like living in the motorhome for three months. Um, so it's kind of a window into what we, what we hope is the future of education, which is more for students, by students curriculum and programming. Um, that really empowers and galvanizes students on the front end rather than just like hitting them with standards and tests and rubrics on the back end. Um, focusing more upstream on the more self-efficacy student agency side of the equation that will then help them to engage and then you start to see some of those outcomes downstream rather than focusing the, the other way around. So essentially the curriculum is a three-part curriculum. Part one is called exposure, part two is called self-construction, and part three is the road trip project. Part three is the component where it's kind of the big culminating piece where they're actually going out in their communities and building these, these projects. But we knew with a lot of the populations that we were serving, having them to basically build a road trip is kind of like Sure, right, I'm going to go cold call the mayor of my local town or like an EMT technician. We realized we needed to have some exploratory experience up front. So for part one, what we did was we had our staff go through the entire interview archive of 1,100 interviews over the last 10 years and start to take that ethnographic approach of essentially boiling down the common themes and insights of how these leaders have figured out what they wanted to do with their lives. We then took those themes and boiled them down to what we call the seven core axles of Road Trip Nation, which are these kind of real life insights in terms of how people have figured out what they wanted to do with their life. So if your parents aren't the, you know, didn't, you know, you don't go up, you didn't grow up with like, you know, Howard Schultz as your dad or someone who had these incredible insights, you know, this is a way to kind of boil, boil that down. Um, and they're all basically, and then each, each lesson, um, like making it work, we're going to play here in a second is essentially boiled down into these kind of topical lessons from the archive along this theme. So we're going to play one sample lesson here, which is making it work, which we heard time and time again. This is a perfect commonality, is that 
finding your road in life is not always easy. It's not like you just stick it, find your dream, and you make it happen. You know, along the way there are lots of potholes. You know, be a bar, you know, being a bartender to pay off financial what I did aid. Is a series of um, many all that. So here's 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 an example of, of that theme. What I did is a series of many odd jobs. You know, I worked in a music store. I, I did all of these different jobs, none of which were very gratifying. And at night, I did what I really wanted to do, which was watch television and think about it and have opinions and bore people with my opinions about what I, what I thought. Over time, it just became apparent that, gee, I seemed to know a lot about that, or at least I believed that I did. So uh, I found myself at a TV network. I took a massive pay cut uh, to deliver mail, and it really wasn't mail. They could have told me we want you to dig holes out in the backyard or you know we want you to tie string together all day long uh, but if there were TV monitors in the vicinity I would have been happy. Is it getting worse? Yeah we, we've put about 10,000 miles on it in the past six weeks. Well I'd have to say major engine work from listening to that to be honest with you. <laughs> It's okay. I think it's just going. It's on its last leg. Look, unless someone's handing you something right after you get out of school, it's going to be tough for the first couple years. I've slept in every rest stop along the Jersey Turnpike. I had an alarm clock, a comforter, and a pillow in the back. I put my seat on recline. Um, I had a portable toothbrush. I would take a bird bath in the bathroom. I would show up at the radio station here in New York, and I would do my shift. I ate, you know, <laughs> in rotation, you know, tomato soup and uh, SpaghettiOs and tuna fish every day for a year. Average day, I, I do 18 to 20 hour days. The first five years of this job were really, really emotionally difficult for me. And so I remember going home on the train my first years, I shouldn't admit this on camera, but um, crying a lot because it was so, it was so difficult. I used to sit in my um, dorm my freshman year, and I was so afraid to leave to go brush my teeth that I would wait until I heard everyone was sleeping at like 2.33 a.m. just to go brush my teeth so I can run back into my room. I was like petrified of people. But I did have my dream of being a broadcaster, and that's what you know kept me on my path. You might live in an apartment that is the size of this. You know, you might not be able to afford to buy clothes. None of that stuff is important in your grinding years. The things that you learn about yourself on the way are the most important things. Ah, I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta go. Every second that we try to find this place, we're taking, taking time off the interview. I drew for hours and endless hours every day, without fault, every day, seven days a week, until I got my portfolio pages right. What happened was that I was working at, uh, at a lighting design store and a guy comes in uh, who needed some, some lighting for his studio. I asked him what kind of art he does and he says, well, I'm, I work in comics. And I said, do you know anybody at DC at Marvel or at Marvel? He says, I know one guy at DC. He was just hired there. He's a brand new editor, uh, so don't expect a lot. So I went down there with my portfolio and he wouldn't even, the editor wouldn't even see me in his office. He saw he met me in the lobby. And he's like, all right, what do you got, kid? What do you got? And I opened up my portfolio and he's like, holy mackerel, this, this is good. He's like, wait here, right? <laughs> so he comes back, he's like, listen, you're broke, aren't you? I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty broke. <laughs> he's like, do, do an inventory cover. Here are three characters that appear in this story. Just give me a cover with these three characters, all right? And come back when you're finished. I went home, I finished the cover overnight, and I was at his doorstep at DC first thing in the morning. Once again, he meets me in the hallway, He's like, in the lobby. He's like, what are you doing here? I'm like, here's your cover. <laughs> He's like, I didn't need it overnight. I'm like, here's your cover. And, and, he, and he looks at me, and I, and I had these really sort of sad puppy dog eyes, and he's like, he's like, you need a job, don't you? I'm like, yeah. He's like, man, I, I'm sorry. I got, I've got nothing. He's like, but I'll tell you what, wait out here. I'll, <laughs> I'll ask around the office, see if somebody's got something, but you know, don't hold your breath. Uh, I'm like, okay. So I'm literally sitting in the lobby. It must have been an hour plus. And the receptionist picks up the phone and she says, okay, okay. And she hangs up. She's like, uh, are you Joe Quesada? I'm like, yeah. She's like, um, Mr. Owsley would like to see you in his office. I'm like, okay. So I, I trot on over to the office. And I'll never forget this. As long as I live, I will never forget this. I walk through the door 
and he looks at me, he's like, what are the odds that while you're waiting out there, one of my two artists on my two books just calls and quits? I'm like, it's pretty astronomical. He's like, what are the odds that I'm gonna offer you the job? I'm like, next to Neil, he's like, you want the job? I'm like, sure. If you hadn't got that cover done the night before. Exactly. Yeah. My, my whole life would have been completely different. That's incredible. Comple I may never, I may, I may have gotten a, a, a day job that would have been, you know, maybe distracted me, whatever it may be. I, I, I firmly also believe, though, that, that people, if you have the desire and the passion, which I did, I would have eventually broken in. Some people are just incredibly naturally talented and are born athletes or born singers or born artists, and they could just one day sit down and just do it. And, you know, but those are the one in a gazillion that can actually do that. Everyone else on planet Earth has to work really, really hard for it. You know, as far as like work and work ethic, you know, you have to work hard, you know what I mean? Like always work hard, don't expect anybody to give you anything. It's not like I walked into MTV and it was like, woo, I'm directing yeah. two weeks later. I mean, I worked my butt off for a long time. If you think of your situation as being like a tripod on three legs that hit the ground and each of those legs has a name, and one of them is luck, the other one is talent, and the other one is hard work. Although one of those things will get you into a situation as quickly as possible, you have to get another one of those tripod legs on the ground. You just have to like run at something until something is talking to your heart loudly enough that you won't even have to wonder, you know, if it's the right thing. But you have to run pretty hard, and you have to be a moron along the way, and you have to accept that there's going to be a lot of wasted time and energy, and that that's not a bad thing. It is more important to me to fulfill this larger goal, which I wanted Chicago to have a Shakespeare theater. And so I always came back to that and saying, you know what, so you're crying, so you had a horrible day but you're still doing something that if you left, you might never forgive yourself. There was something in me that just said, you're not gonna fail, it's just how long is it gonna be hard for? Like anything else in life, it's a huge roller coaster, right? There'll be high times, low times, happy times, sad times. Will I Am wore my shoe uh, to, I think, the BET Awards. The shoe got on display at the, the DNC. And then like the first big thing that happened was the Smithsonian emailing me and I thought it was a joke. I would say, no, I had to call the lady and it's like, are you serious? You want my shoe in the largest museum in the world? Like I painted, the, I painted tennis shoe that I did and she was like, yes, we, we want it, it's beautiful. And I cried, I was like, I was almost homeless in January. Like had I quit, had I quit a month before I made that shoe? Have I quit an hour before I made that shoe and decided I'm just gonna forget about art and do I This would never happen. Like, I could have quit. I was about to be kicked out of my house and I didn't quit and then look what happened. One thing that does give me satisfaction when I sit back and think about like what could have happened, you know, what if, what if I just got a job doing something that I didn't enjoy and, you know, kind of like stayed back in Boston and was with the guys that I grew up with and you know, and it didn't really evolve and grow and change and be the person I could have been. That, that gives me satisfaction when I look back and go, wow, I don't even really work, you know? I'm doing what I love to do, it's fun. The UG um, named me like reporter of the year last year and I just, can't, I can't believe it. I can't, I can't believe that I'm getting to do exactly what I wanted to do. I'm seriously, seriously living my dream. See, I'm getting emotional because I, I really didn't think this was gonna happen and it's happening, so. To you guys, I say, just keep fighting, keep doing your thing. Third in the curriculum that's mostly based on the 10 years of Roach Mission content and, and interviews. Um, the curriculum culminates with a project-based learning experience where students build their own local road trip projects. Um, and we're going to show you one example video now. Of, uh, and this is the part that's been really exciting for us. Over the last three years, we've had 100,000 students in schools across 22 states building these road trip projects as part of their classroom assignments. Mostly in English language arts or advisory periods or 8th to ninth grade transition programs. We're right at the point where a lot of students are really in danger of kind of dropping out and not seeing the relevance of kind of why I'm in ed education in the first place. Um, but here's an example of, of what, and this is on YouTube. So YouTube, we're um, also launching some really new exciting partnerships with, with YouTube here at Google, which is exciting as well. Um, but he, here's an example of um, how we started to see students across the country doing Road Trip Nation projects and releasing them through, through YouTube. If you live in San Diego, you know Sam. 
Sam the Cooking Guy. A couple of Hoover students decided to get the 411 on how Sam got to be a local TV celebrity. This is a road trip nation project, San Diego style. I was 40 when I figured it out. 40. 40. I had no clue the rest of the time. And I did like five different things trying to just keep myself from, you know, going crazy and figuring out how to make some money. But it took me to get to that age before I finally went, holy shit, this is like, maybe this could work. Just to kind of end on impact, what we've been learning lately in education is that you can't just go into the education world and say, we're going to inspire people. There's a responsibility when you're working with students, especially students in the communities where we work. And so over the last year, um, the Hewlett Foundation has funded a third-party efficacy study on road trip nation's expansion and proliferation through these school systems and try to really ascertain what is the impact we're really having on these students. Um, and essentially what they've been finding is that students, through different modalities in terms of how they've researched this, but they, they've coined, they've, they've determined that students' self-efficacy rates, which is essentially students' self-belief in their ability to solve comp complex problems, and more of kind of the non-cognitive senses in terms of their, their belief in themselves and their futures, have increased at, at significant rates, um, but also that their GPA rates have been increasing. So this study just came out last week by um, Dr. David Conley, but it found that students in a comparison study in San Jose Unified School District in credit recovery settings, the most at-risk students, when the, the Road Trip Nation students over a nine-month period had twice the rate of GPA increase when compared to the non-Road Trip Nation students in the exact same socioeconomic and demographic settings. And the researcher said this was interesting because Road Trip Nation, the, nowhere in our curriculum do we say study hard, get good grades, follow the standards, all those things. I mean, it's all kind of connected to the new Common Core standards for ELA, anchor standards on the back end, so it's legit from a district standpoint. But we focus more on the self-efficacy component. The students taking ownership over their futures and actually being an active participant in what do they want to do with their life. And by focusing on those more upstream self-efficacy factors, we start to see downstream academic gains start to increase. So this is kind of like, you're, it's an interesting part of the journey for Road Trip Nation because by no means, it is our 10th year anniversary for Road Trip Nation, but we really feel like it's the beginning of an entire new 10-year 10, 10 chapter where we're kind of continuing to proliferate the movement and we're just kind of scratching the surface on, on what we can do. So we just want to thank you guys for, for kind of staying here for lunch and kind of listening to our story. And um, if you guys have any questions, we're, we're here to give you a sense of how, how the heck we're, we're doing this. So <laughs> I had a quick question about um, what you, if you saw a difference with the economy kind of going down and coming back up in this last 10 years and how that impacted your conversations with both the people you're interviewing and then the students. Yeah, I mean, I, th I, th I think it was interesting because when we started, <clears throat> it was just before like the, the crash. Um, and it was all like every single magazine of every business cover was like how to hire the best people. And it was like a totally incredibly competitive place. But I think as a young person getting out of college and trying to find that first job, there was still that, that question in your mind of like, do I take that huge signing bonus salary job that like my parents will be really excited about? Or do I take this thing that I actually really care about? And I think regardless of the economic times, I think those same questions are asked. Um, and, and the realities obviously are different. And there's more compromise that, that each, in, each of us as individuals have to take in certain situations. But those fundamental questions of who am I and what's important to me and do I make these decisions for myself or for other people, those, I, I don't think those ever change. I, I would also add too, and perhaps it's more of a generational thing than an economic crisis, but uh, people wanted to be involved in mission-driven companies. The mission-driven side, um, you know, CSR, corporate social responsibility started to become really hot. And a lot of the generations that we were working with, I mean, this, the college students, they really want to be a part of something bigger that was sustainable, that had a lasting impression, that had a lasting footprint. And I think that was something that we were really hearing from both sides. And I think some of it was probably driven from the economic side. But I think a lot of the gen you know, the, this younger generation we're working with, they want to be a part of something that was going to last the test of time. So I think mission-driven started to become pr a pretty big theme, as, as you guys know. And that, that last theme of making it work, we've seen that be more pervasive as well, which is, you know, I mean, you can follow what it is you're really passionate about and define your own road, but you've got to find a way to make it work. That's why that whole theme in the curriculum was called making it work. Because essentially, you know, you might see someone who's the director of Saturday Night Live, um, but 
you know, what you also need to hear is that she worked at the Gap, you know, for two years during the holidays so she could, like, pay her rent because she was getting paid next to nothing, you know, um, doing her thing. And, you know, I'm sure even, like, like, the roots of Google, you know, I mean, you see this huge thing today, but, like, I'm sure in the early days there was a lot of making it work that had to happen, whether it was starting it out of a garage or whatever, not being in this big fancy um, office building. I mean, there... That in, in America, we're so success obsessed in our culture, we kind of forget those parts of the story, like the groveling periods. And I think that we've really tried to really celebrate that with Road Trip Nation, where we're looking back on these people's stories as like, these are the grinding times when, yes, they may have take, taken a really tough path, um, but how do we inspire and empower the next generation of kind of leaders to, you know, who, who's going to be the next person that cures cancer? You know, like, what if that, what if there's a kid out there who has like a real genius instinct for science but who never really connected with that interest because A, there was no, too much noise and pressure around them to, you know, not go away to college, to stay home and be with a family or, you know, B, that it's going to be too hard. You know, I don't want to make it work and that's going to be way, get my PhD, no freaking way. I'm going to go, you know, do something much easier. So what we're trying to do is decipher all of these stories down and I, I think that um, as culture changes, there is some kind of tonality shifts, but I think per Nate's point, like a lot of the core ethos remain pretty consistent. Have you ever thought to expand this program internationally? Um, yes, we, we have done a few international road trips. Um, we actually started to tone it back a little bit only because we realized that America is so big. And now that we've really gotten into the heavy lifting work, and we talk about hard work like education, that is really hard, complicated, you know, incredible work. Um, and so, when we started to see how, you know, over the last three years we've expanded 22 states and that has taken all of our focus. So Road Trip Nation, it's much bigger than just Nate, Brian, and I know. We have 40 employees. We have an office space down in Southern California um, in Costa Mesa, right between LA and San Diego. And uh, we have 40 totally dedicated, passionate individuals who are building this, you know, editing the footage, implementing the curriculum, working with the schools, um, you know, researching the data, all of that. And so um, I think we've seen the, the need to focus that effort domestically for now, but we do ultimately, you know, have a vision of going to countries around the world that really, ob obviously, where their youth are in high need of figuring out what their futures are as well, so. To what degree have you found that it's not just adversity that people are overcoming, but also a sense of diversity in their lives or in their work experience and stuff like that that's really helped fuel them or push them on to their ultimate careers? Diversity in what sense do you mean? Diversity in like difference and, and things that they've done or experiences that they've had and stuff. Right. I think we, we hear that constant plea of oh, do follow your passion and that kind of thing. But part of it is sometimes people maybe, it's not that they don't have passions right. or particular passions, but they don't really know what their passion is or right. where they would find that. So in, in, in experiencing a diverse life or a diverse uh, right. jobs or diverse career paths and that kind of thing can sometimes lead you then to eventually totally. what it is that... Uh, that you really love. Yeah, I I think I think I would say that that diversity, that ability, and that comfort to kind of just be okay wandering is something that like uh, an instructor or a counselor or, or a parent is. Ha it's a really it's hard advice to give to somebody, mm -hmm. but I think as we've interviewed so many people, that's the reality of their life. You know, I mean, I think. Um, that sense of kind of just bumping into things is a really important part. And I think what we've seen is that the people that are comfortable kind of following their own compass and then having that diversity of experience, those are the ones that kind of start on one thing and then realize, oh, well, there's something about this that's interesting and there's something about this. And if I put them together, I'll get here. But those that take that linear path often miss those other opportunities. So, I mean, I think some of the most interesting people have been uh, comfortable wandering and changing careers and starting over and there's countless examples of people that we've had that have had that exact experience. Um, I know you primarily targeted like school children and people are like starting up like what's your experience with like people who are in a midlife crisis or you know need to <laughs> figure out the next thing they've had like a mindless corporate job for majority of their lives and you know not Google yeah. by the way it's just <laughs> it's <laughs> other companies so what, what's your experience been? Yeah, I mean, our, our, our mission very intentionally is to empower people to define their own roads in life. Um, we've only been really focusing on students because they're so vulnerable at that age, especially in certain geographic locations around America where, you know, if you don't focus in on some demographics of students, like the alternate thing is like a student that drops out of high school is eight times as likely to be more incarcerated um, or living on welfare or to, to have, be, have kids that are also on welfare and be incarcerated. So, um, 
you know, but we, we rehear all the time, because we have a PBS series, the demographic is a little bit older, and we hear all the time like, that the message is timeless. The message is you don't just define your own road in life when you're 18 years old and then you like stick it, great, no big deal. You know, like something that's, you know, defining your own road in life happens throughout your entire life. And so um, especially when you get into your 30s, 40s, 50s, and you have this kind of wealth of experience, um, just kind of being open and pliable and, and taking a lot of these same kind of ethos and themes and applying them to your own life, like Nate was saying, I mean, mashing it up, having more experiences, be comfortable with wandering. Um, I think that we, we absolutely see this as like a, a lifelong piece. So. I mean, I, I think one story that comes to mind is the founder of Sam Adams. You know, he was a consultant, and I think it was at Bain Capital, I think? Boston Consulting Boston Group. Boston Consulting Group. And, you know, here he was kind of going through the, the machine. He was part of that machine. And, you know, there are consultants that absolutely love what they do, but he just wasn't one of them. And uh, when the road troopers were asking him, like, what about that risk? You leave this really high-paying job and you're going to go brew beer in your mom's kitchen. And you watched him pause for a while and really kind of think about it. And I loved his reaction. And his reaction was the bigger risk would have been staying and doing something that I didn't love than taking this risk and brewing beer in my mom's kitchen. You know? And I think that it's, it's the clarity um, and the confidence that, that need to come together in those moments. And so the exposure we have is that we've, while it's young people road tripping, we're talking to people that have kind of figured it out. So we're kind of getting in on both ends. But, you know, that's an example. Of kind of like, we can chill, right. too. Well, I was going to say, uh, to, to close, what is the um, number one tip you have for driving an RV across <laughs> your 10 years of experience? Our RV driving is a team sport. That was, like, our whole thing. So... Um, I think that like our first road trip prepared us for building a business together, because if you can kind of like get a motorhome, especially a 30-year-old motorhome around the country in one piece, like it's and same thing like when you're driving down the road. There's not, I mean, blind spot is an understatement. I mean, you just you really can't see when you're changing lanes. So like if you're gonna change lanes, it's like I'm going change lanes. So someone's out the window, you know, please, you know, don't I'm coming in. So. <laughs> The oddest thing is there's a rear view mirror in an RV, yeah. but you can't, right. there's no, you only look at the person sitting in the couch behind you. <laughs> I would say uh, you, you don't wait until you, you master it. I, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress, and that might be a deep metaphor, but you, you, you got to hit the road sooner or later, and I, and I would say uh, you're, you, you, you can't, you don't wait until you've got it all figured out, because uh, when you get to Boston and there's no grids there, you, you're, you're screwed, so yeah. just do, train as you go. I would say be comfortable getting lost. You know, I think that's something that actually I have a complaint about with the GPS is that you don't get lost. And the number of times that we had meaningful experiences when we just got lost, we've lost those lost moments. And so I think in life or in driving, get lost every once in a while. That note, and thank you very much for speaking with us today. Amazing speech. Yeah.